thank you all for coming to hear about fish. I love to talk about fish, and I have to say I've been fascinated with fish for as long as I can remember. Uh, I grew up in this area, so I was one of those people that, one of those kids that was always running up and down streams looking for fish, especially salmon. I moved off to the East Coast for 25 years, and then I saw, oh, there's this job being offered at UW Bothell. And I remember there's a salmon bearing stream that goes right through the middle of campus there, which is really something that would appeal to me. So that was what really grabbed my attention. And one of the things that I didn't expect was that it would be a an opportunity for such a really interesting research topic. Just I feel like I kind of fell into something that ended up being really exciting for me, and I hope you guys enjoy it. Uh, just a little bit about my background. There's an artist, Ray Troll, that some of you may know of. He works out of, uh, I think it's Sitka, but he does a lot of fish art. And this is the background I have is from a mural down at University of Washington College of Fisheries, where I graduated in 1984. So it was some time ago. In any event, I was very happy to come back to the West Coast and very happy to be around fish again. Uh, salmon, that is. So uh, the title is Little Redfish Lost and Found, The Rediscovery of Bothell's Own Native Salmon. I've kind of given away the, the final bit here, but I want to start with a little context about uh, why this is such a remarkable thing to have found still having native salmon here. Uh, we are generally a salmon culture. Everybody generally knows about salmon. A small percentage of those actually know that creeks like North Creek and Little Bear and many of the small streams around here do still get returns of salmon. What people generally don't know is most of those fish are not native. Uh, there's a much uh, different history to salmon in the Lake Washington Basin than people are aware of. So the salmon I work on are called kokanee salmon. And I'll just give a little uh, start by defining what those actually are. So many of you know about sockeye salmon. They're really important commercially. They do the usual salmon thing of going out to the ocean, from, or be a, hatching out streams, going out to the ocean, getting nice and big and tasty, coming back into the streams and spawning. Um, there's another kind of, um, well, we'll call it a kind of sockeye for now. So it's the same species, Oncorhynchus nerca, called kokanee. They're similar to sockeye, except that they come out of the streams and they go to a lake, get large, but not as large as they would if they went out to the ocean, and then they come back to the streams and spawn. So in many ways, it's just like what we think of typical salmon, except they're using a big lake instead of the ocean to get large and mature. And kokanee have evolved from ancestors that had a sockeye life cycle. Life cycle. So often what happens, and this is apparently what happened here, is you get glaciers or something else that makes it difficult for migration to happen. Since sockeye are pretty good at hanging out in lakes before they go to the ocean anyway, it's relatively easy for them to evolve a freshwater only life cycle and they just stay in the lakes and get big before moving up to spawn. So a consequence of that uh, is that they're usually smaller. As I mentioned, there are a few other things that stand out that make them look a little bit different. These are, uh, on the top is a male sockeye from the Sammamish River. Bottom is a kokanee from the Sockeye River. You can see they look generally fairly similar other than the size. Uh, there, as I said, there's some things like spots and some other things that make them distinguishable. Uh, since I have it up here, I'll mention kokanee are small enough for herons to eat. So great blue herons will quite happily eat these. I find lots of dead fish with spear marks from the beaks of herons that have gone through them. Fortunately, sockeye are too big for even the most ambitious heron to go after. So this is a view of a kokanee in the stream and a sockeye in the stream to give you a sense of the size comparison. So, all right, so I've got lots of sockeye around, fewer than we would like, but there's still good numbers of sockeye. And I really got interested in sockeye, sorry, kokanee back in 2015. I teach a biology of salmon course in fall. And I'd heard about this guy, Wally Pereira, out on Lake Sammamish, who single-handedly was largely responsible for maintenance of a kokanee population out at Lake Sammamish that would spawn in a stream on his property. So this is Wally up here talking to some of my students. There's a little stream back here. Uh, here's some students down on the lower center that 
at least some years, gets a really nice run of native kokanee up there. And I thought, this is awesome. What's cooler than having a little stream like this with these bright red fish coming through there? And when they're in, when the population's strong, they can be super abundant. So there's little red flags here that mark where uh, spawning nests have been made. And the whole stream was just littered up and down with where these fish had been spawning. So I thought, this is the greatest thing to have all these bright, beautiful fish coming into this little stream. But then I started thinking, well, what about us? Here we are in along the Sammamish River, We've got this wonderful stream coming up through North Creek. Why don't we have kokanee here? I started looking into the literature about it. And yeah, you know, people say, yeah, there aren't any kokanee around. And maybe think about, well, what about all these other streams? There are tons of little streams that are perfectly, seem perfectly well suited to kokanee. Why is it that Lake Sammamish gets kokanee and all these little streams have no kokanee in them? Well, it turns out that at one point they did have kokanee. They had lots and lots of kokanee. So this is from, I love to spend a lot of time looking into the literature of various kinds. This is from the Seattle Daily Times in 1917, describing a game warden seeing uh, pretty far up North Creek, what they used to call red trout or silver trout, which is another name for kokanee. So he had seen them. And in fact, lots of uh, early settlers in the area would remark on just how they were in the streams by the thousands. Um, they would call them red trout, silver trout, little red fish was very common. I live in Lake Forest Park, and we have two little streams here that you could easily jump over. And early settlers from, say, the 19-teens um, described them as being thousands in both of these little streams around here. So clearly, they were super abundant. Uh, Native Americans, of course, knew all of this long ago. And in fact, kokanee were particularly interesting and important to them as a source of food. Most of those, I'll just go back a little bit. Most of these little streams would have been uh, fishing villages where local Native American tribes would have gone to harvest kokanee in season. Uh, down here is a creek called May Creek. The native name for that is um, refers to the drying place where little red fish would be collected and dried. So clearly they were important uh, to Native Americans, but they all, uh, the Lake Washington populations disappeared. So just other uh, people had also noticed, I'm holding in my hands right now, uh, some fish, some kokanee that were collected in a small tributary of Lake Washington, it's not clear exactly which one, in 1889. Um, and I have a bunch of fish from the 1880s, 1890s that I'm hoping to do genetics on. So people have been noticing and collecting these for a long time. What they hadn't really been noticing or commenting on were the big salmon, the ones we normally think of when we go down to the locks and see the big fish coming through. So, and this is uh, one of these little fish that hoping to get genetic info out of soon. So historically, um, the general view is that there was an early run of kokanee that when that was in Issaquah Creek going into Lake Sammamish, that was um, that came in in August and September, so it's quite early. A middle run, which is what these kind of yellowish bars are, that were in most of the streams in the Sammamish River and going into Lake Washington, and then a late run, which is this green one that went into some other streams in Lake Sammamish. So that's the general view of the three populations that would have been here, say, 120 years ago. What appears to be the case now, or what appeared, I'll put it in past tense now, was that uh, this early run in Issaquah Creek uh, disappeared in 2002. That's pretty clear. So they're gone. The view was that the middle run fish were also gone. There's lots of references to, you know, they're just no longer here. Uh, all this urbanization, all these other things have eventually driven them to extinction. And then this late run here and some of these small streams is still around. Uh, I'm part of a work group that's involved in trying to maintain and restore these. But boy, it's really struggling along. Uh, on this graph over here is numbers of returning fish. 
uh, for the last decade or so. Yeah, there was a good year in 2012. There was a pretty good year in 2015. But most of the returns since then have been around 100 or less for the entire Lake Sammamish. So that's really right on the precipice of disappearing. Uh, last year, 2021, was actually pretty good. But then this year, we have less than 100 fish returning. So the overall view is, boy, it's been a hard century for Kokanee. Uh, early runs gone, middle runs gone, and the late runs just barely hanging up. So with that context, um, I was still interested in Kokanee. I was thinking, man, isn't there some way that I could maybe sneak out some of those fish from Lake Sammamish and use them to restore Kokanee to some of our local streams? And you know, the more I looked at that population, the less likely it seemed that anyone was ever going to let me take any of their eggs and move them down here. But something else I noticed uh, on my bike trip into campus, among other times, was that after the usual sockeye had come in and done their spawning in North Creek and in the Sammamish River and so on, most of them had died. And then I started noticing these small fish. And I wasn't the first one to notice them, but they come kind of late in the year. So people hadn't really been paying much attention to them. A few people had talked about them, but nobody had really looked at them very closely. The assumption was, well, they must be some introduced fish or they must be you know, somehow part of the sockeye population. So I started looking at this a lot more closely. This is what things looked like in 2020 in Woodenville right near the mouth of Little Bear Creek. Those are all small, kokanee-sized fish. Uh, I don't think there's a, oh, there's one sockeye. Way to the right side, there's a sockeye over here. But uh, they're just about all kokanee. The sockeye have come, they've mostly spawned, and they've disappeared. So, hmm, that looked like it was something interesting to pursue a little bit more. Likewise, on the Bothell campus in 2020, oh, I should say in 2017 and 20, uh, I noticed the same kind of thing. At the same time they were out in Lake, in uh, the Sammamish River, they were also spawning uh, in North Creek. This is actually taken on campus. It's a little harder to see, but there's probably 20 or so individual kokanee here. You can see where the gravel stirred up, where they've been digging nests. So I, again, I refer to these as mystery nurka because it really wasn't clear how they fit in with anything else. And that's really been the focus of my research and what I was um, doing with the SRCP funding. And I'll just mention that, okay, I saw them in 2017, saw them in 2020. When I first came here and first started expressing interest in Kokanee, I would hear these mysterious tales about, oh, you should have been here, as fishing historians often go, you should have been here in 2011 because there was a gigantic run of kokanee. I heard this from Gabe Barnes. And as with all, a lot of these great stories, I, you know, I said, do you, well, do you have any photographs? Do you have any movies? And he said, oh, yeah, I've, I've got, oh, well, I had photos and movies, but that hard drive failed, so I don't have it anymore. So it was all out there, kind of like this big mystery, this tantalizing thing going on. But then I started uh, talking to more fish biologists, and lo and behold, they had seen something similar. And in fact, they had collected some specimens. They thought this was kind of weird, but they just sat, not well, they collected tissue samples. Uh, the samples just sat on their shelves for years. Nobody was looking at them. Nobody had a question around which they could pursue it. So yeah, it's kind of an interesting background history. And this is actually taken just above 405, so just above campus in 2011. This is a fish biologist, Dan Lance, and they were collecting great numbers of kokanee there. So I was very glad that I got to know the person who somewhere in one of his cabinets actually had all these samples. I'll come back to these in a little bit. So the questions I was interested in with this um, as RCP was, if I look at the genetics of this these fish, these mystery nerka, where do they sit relative to these introduced sockeye, to these 
late running kokanee that are still around in Lake Sammamish and whatever other populations might be in here. I was also um, interested in what their migratory pattern was. So the question is, or the general question is, is what, what are mystery nirka? What the heck are these? Where do they come from? How do they go about making their living? One possibility is that they were introduced from somewhere else. So much of the 20th century fisheries biology was about finding fish that you like and putting them everywhere you could think of. So millions of kokanee were brought into the Lake Washington, Lake Sammamish system from uh, Whatcom Lake. And some people liked the kokanee we had here, so millions were sent off other places. Nobody kept a really good track about where they went, but they ended off somewhere else. So it's possible that there could be introduced kokanee, and that's what I was seeing. Could also be that they were part of the sockeye population, so that the biology there is a little bit complicated, but sometimes sockeye will leave behind some small ones. Or, and this seemed like a super unlikely possibility, and that was despite what everybody had been saying for the last 30 years, maybe some of those native middle run fish that people saw in such abundance uh, 100 years ago were still around. And that's what these were. So I was interested in figuring that out using genetics. And then I also wanted to know something about their migration. Are they behaving like kokanee? Are they different from what sockeye do? So we'll start with the genetics. So I'm not going to go into the details, although I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Uh, what I did and my students did was we collected lots and lots and lots of samples of these mystery nurka, along with um, sockeye. And this we did this work in collaboration with the, the Molecular Genetics Lab in Olympia for w, Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. And what we did was we compared the genetics of these mystery nurka, not just with Lake Sammamish kokanee, not just with the Cedar River sockeye that are introduced, but with uh, over 30 populations of kokanee and sockeye throughout the Pacific Northwest. We wanted to see where this population would land relative to all these other places they might have been brought in from and how they compare to other populations that were here. So um, this is a diagram showing genetic diversity for sockeye and kokanee in the Lake Sammamish, Lake Washington system. Don't worry so much about what the axes are, just these circles more or less represent different populations genetically. There were a few samples around of these early run Sammamish kokanee that had disappeared. They show up as distinct from anything else. These are late run Sammamish kokanee that are still around and struggling along. These are sockeye that have been introduced to Lake Washington. So these come from Baker Lake. That's the main population that people uh, are trying to keep going here now. And then these are sockeye. I'm not sure exactly what to make of these. It looks like there might have been some interbreeding between a native population of sockeye and introduced uh, sockeye. That, that one's a little bit unclear. So we wanted to know where do these mystery nerka fit relative to everybody else? And where they fit was over with the kokanee, over with uh, particularly the late run Lake Sammamish kokanee, but also with the early run uh, Sammamish kokanee. So they're clearly not part of the introduced sockeye population. They're clearly not part of Bear Creek sockeye, and they're not part of any other kokanee or sockeye population that we know of anywhere else in uh, the Pacific Northwest. So this was totally unexpected because again, people thought these were extinct. And it was really helpful for me because what I'm really interested in doing is restoring kokanee to a lot of these small streams around here. Once you know that it's a native population, it makes the argument a lot stronger than saying, oh, I'm gonna take this non-native population and try to stick it into all of these places it becomes more an issue of restoring native populations to places where they were once very abundant. So that was a really cool finding. Uh, let's see what else. Did, oh, um, and I'll just mention, we went back and we looked at the 2011 fish. They land right on top of the mystery nurka that I uh, got from 2017 and 2020. And one weird thing that's happened is 
my sense was that there's probably a strong run of Kokanee every third year based on, well, they ran in 2011 in big numbers. Don't know about 2014, but 2017 and 2020 were both really good years. So I thought, okay, well, 2023 is going to be a big year. Because Kokanee are always full of surprises, it turns out that there was a big run this year. And I have no idea where they came from. Usually Kokanee uh, run on th uh, every third year. Par pardon me. They run as three-year-olds. I didn't see any fish in there in 2019. So I don't know what's going on yet, but we'll figure it out. So in any event, this seems to be a really robust um, result. We've got a lot more data from it now, and it's holding up pretty well. So yay, they're not extinct after all. I love telling this story because there aren't very many happy stories about how salmon are doing. And to find that we've got a native population that's still here is certainly quite nice. So that's a lot of what I did with the SRCP. The other thing I'm interested in is looking at, well, do these fish, these mystery nurka, can I prove that they haven't gone out to the ocean? And even better, could I prove that their parents haven't gone out to the ocean? So is this a population that generation after generation is staying in fresh water? So it turns out there's a really handy way to figure that out. Uh, fish have mineral uh, structures inside their head called otoliths. They're part of the inner ear. And what they do, since they're made of mineral, is they record the minerals, the the I guess a profile of the minerals where they're developing as they're growing. If they grow up in fresh water, they'll have fresh water minerals. Then they'll go out to the ocean, pick up some salt water minerals, and then come back. But the cool difference between kokanee and uh, sockeye is that kokanee would have had parents that were fresh water. Since it's the parent, the mother, that's providing some of the minerals to the egg, that means right at the very beginning when the otolith is tiny, that's going to be a freshwater signature. Sockeye, on the other hand, would have gone out to the ocean. When the mother comes back and lays the eggs, the minerals that that little baby is going to get right at the center would come from the ocean. So you could distinguish between where the parents were, not just where the individuals were. So the way that's done is to... Um, Grind down otoliths so you can get right to the interior, and then you blast a laser along them, and you look at what kinds of um, isotopes, mineral components, get released when you do that. So what you would expect, oops, if I was, I was grinding, grinding across here with the laser, is if this was a sockeye, ocean, 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 fresh water while it was living in the lake, and then ocean where it got minerals from the mother. If it's kokanee, then I would expect fresh water, fresh water, fresh water, fresh water all the way down if its parents were also fresh water. So there's a really handy way to distinguish these. This is technically and financially a challenging thing to do, and I've had to switch labs. I don't have a lot of results from this, but what we've seen so far is that, and without worrying too much about what the axis is here, this is what more or less the marine environment looks like when you do this kind of laser work. For the entire span of the otolith for a number of different fish, at no point, whether it's from the outside edge or all the way, all the way in the interior, do they look like they have any saltwater signature. So based on what is now a fairly small sample size, it looks like the kokanee not only didn't go out to the ocean themselves, but even their parents didn't. I should say the mystery nurka. So we've got both genetic evidence and at least the beginnings of um, biochemical, biochemical evidence that this is a true breeding kokanee population that is native to the basin, which again is quite cool. So um, there are a few mysteries that come out of this. I'll just briefly mention this. This is a different uh, graph than we saw before. The short thing to grab from this is that the large circles are large fish, sockeye size. The small circles are small fish, kokanee size. And there's more detail, but that's the main thing for us. Every once in a while, and this is genetic clustering. So these are all going to be kokanee of some kind. 
every once in a while, I'll get a big fish that genetically clusters with kokanee. One interpretation of that would be, well, maybe once in a while, kokanee sneak out through the ship canal, through the locks, and grow to, co to sockeye size before coming back. It would have been hard for them to do 150 years ago before they put in the ship canal, but it may be a life history that could um, evolve now under current circumstances. I don't think it happens very often, but we'll be able to figure that out from combining genetics with the microchemistry. And the reason this matters and the things I want to do next is if we can demonstrate these are native populations, it's a great opportunity to do outreach. People are always super excited when I go out and talk about sockeye especially, or kokanee, especially when they hear that they're native and doing well, because you don't get that story very often. I have a salmon watchers program that I also get people involved with on this. There are some challenges for kokanee. Chiefly, they spawn in a very small number of areas. So I've highlighted a few. They spawn just above 405 uh, in Bothell. They spawn in great numbers out at the mouth of Little Bear Creek in Woodenville. And then there's a couple other places, but that's not much for the entire entirety of Lake Washington. Turns out the people aren't always careful in what they're doing. Uh, this is a picture that I don't know a lot of the backstory of, but this is at the mouth of um, Little Bear Creek in Woodenville, probably sometime in the 90s. This is where about 85% of all the spawning for these native kokanee happens. Well, in what looks like late summer, there's some kind of coffer dam that's been put in uh, because they're putting in a sewer line, I think. There's this huge plume of sediment coming out of Little Bear Creek because they're doing construction upstream. And all of this is happening right in the primary spawning area for kokanee. It's bad in any event, but I think particularly in this case, because it's so limited for these kokanee and people just aren't aware they are there. And then finally, uh, I do work with remote site incubators, which are egg boxes that you can run along streams. I'm ramping up larger numbers now. And in 2023, I want to be able to use this kokanee population as a source of eggs for reestablishing kokanee in some of these small streams. All right, so plenty of people to thank. This has been a project that's involved not only a lot of collaborations and support at Bothell, but also a whole lot of biologists, citizens, um, cities. I actually do a lot of uh, communication with Woodenville, Kenmore, Bothell, Kirkland, Lake Forest Park, all of whom are super excited about the potential for restoring kokanee. So a lot of what I hope to be doing uh, later this year is getting really active with volunteers, harvesting eggs, and getting some of these remote site incubators running kokanee. Right now, I just use coho salmon because they're easy to get. But a bit, uh, soon, I hope to be using kokanee and get some fish back in these small streams where we don't have them now. So I will stop there so we have time for questions. And thank you for coming and listening. I always have questions, don't I? So yeah. um, I actually got a little bit confused between the Lake Sammamish population versus the Lake Washington population. Mm -hmm. So you had mentioned that there was someone in Lake Sammamish who was uh, maintaining this late population. But then the population that you were looking at is actually a Lake Washington population. So are those two populations really separate from one another? Yeah, um, they're, they're yeah. genetically discrete. So the, the view is that uh, historically, I don't believe it entirely, but the, that there were three genetically distinct populations of kokanee in the Lake Washington, Lake Sammamish system, one down here in Lake Washington and two up in Lake Sammamish. So the early and late ones were in Sammamish and the middle one was in Lake Washington. Right. Got it. That was part of so I will say, just since you ask, that I have in my possession specimens that were collected in August in Swamp Creek, which is down by us, which is super early. And so I don't know how that holds up, but genetically, they're still distinguishable. I'm just not sure the timing is a very good description. Yeah, thank you, Jeff. Uh, yeah, great presentation. Thank you for, for sharing this with us. It's really fascinating. Uh, I just have one question. So you mentioned that the runs kind of have this cycle of three years. Sometimes we have stronger runs 
uh, sometimes weaker ones. Uh, so why this three-year interval between the stronger, weaker? What, what are the causes for those kind of fluctuations in the population? And with this kind of determined uh, range? Yeah, so normally you would have salmon coming back every year and you just have different age groups uh, coming back. Uh, what I suspected happened was that Kokanee populations got driven down to such small numbers that two of the three years just blinked out. There weren't any fish those years. And so you just were left with one year's worth. And every th third year, it would show up. Uh, it's confusing me now because we had a big run in 2020. So I wasn't expecting to see anything now because we didn't have anything in 2019. So one of the things that I'll be able to get out of the otoliths is we can see how old the fish are that have come back this year. I will say it was about 75% male. Uh, it may be that conditions were good out in Lake Washington, so good that a lot of fish um, matured a year early. So that could be a reason why they're coming back early this year. Um, but we'll figure that out, but I don't have the information for sure yet. So if that is the case, then that means it should be an epic run next year because if we already had a good run this year and that's only part of the population, next year when the females come back in greater numbers, it should be a lot. But don't quote me on that. That's really interesting. That sheds a light on a question. Can I just do a little follow-up on that? Sure. Because um, I was wondering where did they go, right? If you're thinking about there's the three years um, and so they're mainly hanging out in Lake Washington. And yeah. okay. So I think there's that one year class that then repeats every third year and they go out Lake Washington mature and then come back. And I get some information about this uh, because I also hang out with anglers who like to go fish for kokanee and they'll save me heads and so on. And I usually know before fish show up if it's gonna be a good year because they start reporting catches in June and July. Um, so I get a sense of, of when the what years are strong. Okay, so when is the early run? So the early run in Lake Sammamish, well, it's gone now, but it used to come back in September and August. Okay. And which then... is a funny thing to do in small streams because rain falls low then, but they came back to the biggest tributary in the Lake Washington system historically, so there was still water there. The okay. late run fish in Lake Sammamish come back to little tiny streams and coming back in August would not be a good idea for them. So they're, they've evolved. That's part of the reason they're genetically discreet is they're evolved to come back later in the year and use different streams. And so this middle run, when you said they came back this year, is that, when, is it, when was that? Oh, um, well, so we've got a very complicated situation with sockeye and other things, but I was out there watching sockeye and then I kept seeing these little fish in early October. And I thought, well, that's weird. There is this thing called a residual, which is really just a sockeye that was lazy and didn't go out to the ocean. So I figured, well, it must be them. But then the small numbers of fish kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger as the sockeye were declining. So the peak usually for middle run fish now is, I would say, mid-November, early to mid-November. And they're still in the stream. And uh, I think the last fish I collected this year was December 7th or so. So they're much later. Yeah, Larry. So Jeff, this two-year cycle actually does bring up another question, which is how are fish sensing their own maturity to usually come back at that three years? Is it is it a growth Cycle. So if you have good conditions, do they usually come back after three years or is it or is it usually or is that really weird? Like, do you see fluctuations like this if conditions happen to be really good for growth? Um, yeah, how do they usually know. So, yes, they, if they grow really well, there's they're more likely to mature a year early. Mm -hmm. We have some fish up at Orcas Island for broodstock program for Lake Sammamish and conditions were maybe a little too good for them because they grew really quickly and they matured mostly at two years, really large numbers at two years. So they will respond to conditions and, and, and mature a little bit earlier. And I don't know whether that means that your third year is going to be good or that your third year is going to suck because half of most of them came back this year, right? Yeah. <laughs> Usually, so for salmon, for ocean-going salmon, there's something called jacks, which come back a year early. 
And those are usually considered a leading indicator. Mm -hmm. So if you get a lot of jacks, it means there's a really good survival and a good run the next year. But yeah, you could look at it the other way. Maybe we used up all the males this year and next year it's going to be a bunch of lonely females and not so many males coming back. So we'll see. It's hard for the females to come back a year early because they have to put a lot of energy into producing eggs, whereas the males, I uh, don't worry so much about that. So that little video I showed you in North Creek of fish swimming, that was just above where the boardwalk goes out. So Laren, you were saying you saw salmon when you were down there earlier in the fall. Uh, those were sockeye at that time, but afterwards there were lots of kokanee right at that same spot. Yeah, they look pretty big for the kokanee that you were yeah. showing us. <laughs> Yeah, the beaver dams actually blocked fish for a long time this year. So I don't think any sockeye got past the wetlands this year. But kokanee did because they were there after the, the dam got blown out. Uh, quick question. So there was a graph where you had big dots and uh -huh. little dots for the kokanee and sockeye. But And you mentioned that there's every once in a while like a really large dot in the kokanee. But I noticed there was a whole bunch of small dots in the sockeye. Is it that those small dots are sockeye, but they didn't? make it out to the ocean and that's exactly why small. yeah okay. so well that's that's what i presume so those are they're called residual sockeye and so when we get to look at the otoliths what i expect to find is that they had parents because you can look right at the middle of the otolith that went to the ocean but they didn't themselves so we okay. should find a saltwater signature for them okay that's what makes it so confusing because you can't visually distinguish these residual sockeye from the kokanee just that the kokanee usually run later, and then we can distinguish them genetically. Okay. I also have another question. I'm not a fish gal, like, but. You I remember you wading around deep in the stream. I There are pictures. <laughs> I have my waders downstairs. I'm ready to go. Uh, so, but I grew up in Snohomish, and I'm very familiar with the chum uh, salmon run, or the pink, is it pink? Yeah, pink chum, Both. right? Mm -hmm. um so those run on a two-year cycle so um how is it kokanee like they prefer like i'm just surprised about this three-year thing <laughs> it's like that's news to me so why what it, do different salmon have different migration runs that are like one year two year and three year or is is there a four year i'm going to find out about next year and be oh uh, well there are occasionally some four-year kokanee uh, sockeye usually run four years. So for each species, there's a standard kind of thing, but there's almost always a lot of variation, except for pink salmon, which are always two. Okay. Uh, and just to make it more confusing, there are uh, odd number of years here, even numbers a little bit north, and every year as you go up to Alaska. So. Oh, okay. Interesting. Thanks. On your last slide, there is a thing called spawning grounds. Is that a oh, yeah. that we all need to watch or... Uh, that is a documentary that was made uh, a couple of years ago. It had its grand opening right before COVID hit. So we, we managed to show it at the UW Seattle Intellectual House. We showed it up in North Bend, and then things kind of got shut down. But okay. uh, we're hoping to re-release it. There's a shorter version that's being made that's going to go on to PBS at some point. But I can get you links if you want to watch it on Vimeo. It's now free to watch on Vimeo. So okay. I can share that. Okay. Yeah, um, it's a really nice. And mostly that's about the Lake Sammamish population. And the story there was it was going to be a video about the triumphant recovery of Kokanee. And then when the filmmaker came out, it turned out to be a terrible year. And it was all about desperate measures being taken to try to save these Kokanee. <laughs> And so, uh, actually, I think that was more compelling than the original version would have been. Okay. <laughs> well, I will definitely have to check it out. Do we have any other questions? Because I, I have one last one. I'm just wondering about the future direction for your research. Yeah. So, I've got a whole bunch of ideas. I have more ideas than time. Uh, but one thing that I'm working on now is um, environmental DNA. So some of you may know that you can actually just go collect samples of water, filter them, and identify any number of things in them. Uh, I'm working on a um, way of identifying kokanee specifically. And what I want to be able to do is use that in a bunch of small streams so we can sample more carefully. And also, uh, one of the things that my students do is 
do um, fry trapping out at Lake Sammamish, we need counts of how many fry are coming out of the gravel so we know what survival has been like. Uh, I'm working on ways to use environmental DNA as a way of doing that so that we don't have to trap all the time. So this coming year, what we're going to do is students will be out there trapping, counting fish as they come out three nights a week. And at the same time, we'll collect water samples and look at quantities of kokanee DNA that are in the water and see if we can find some relationship there that may save us a little effort or allow us to sample more streams. So that's one, one direction. Wow, that's smart. So will that help you decide where to put the remote site incubators? Yeah, it's, it helps with that argument, partly because, you know, it's hard to prove a, an absence of something just by fish surveys because it's easy to overlook fish. Um, so with eDNA, we can also sample. I'll mention one other thing related to outreach. I really want to get some genetics out of these historic museum fish. And I've gotten a little bit of information, but not much. But I I was doing a talk out at Safiad, which is one of these biotech companies in uh, Bothell. And it turned out the guy I was talking to was super excited. And his entire specialty is getting genetic sequence out of medically preserved specimens that are really difficult to do. So I think they're going to help me on doing that. So yeah, that's the other thing I really want to do because I've been talking on for a long time about getting genetic information, but so far we've had very limited success. Exciting. The power of partnership, huh? Yeah. Yeah. It's very it's serendipity. It turns out he also lives on a stream that used to have kokini and may run a remote site incubator out of his backyard. So well, thank you very much. 